Hallelujah. That's our call to worship. Shabbat shalom, you guys. Nice to see you all. I learned that from a friend of mine. He was from the South. He'd always say (laughs) y'all. Plural is all y'all. All y'all, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I hope you're as excited about being here as I am. This fine Shabbat day. We had a storm last night, and wasn't it wonderful to get some rain? Hope you didn't leave your windows down. <laughs> but we all stand. And while they're working on bringing up the Shema on the screen, we'll sing Shabbat Shalom together. So now, you have to put your hands together on this one, guys, okay? Are you ready? Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Hey Hallelujah Hear O Israel You guys ready to hear from Yahweh today Amen Please join with me in the Shema. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod Makuto, Le'olam v'ayed. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom for all eternity. Amen. And then the Ve'ahavta continues from the Shema, which means that you shall love. Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Elohech. Vishim <laughs> Bishop de Kaba Veteka Uva Lacta Kaba Derek Uveshark Beka Uv Kuhumeka Ukshark Tamle Otayodeka Beha Yule Pathafot Beneneka Uktav Tamo Mazuzot Beteka and you shall love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Amen. Now we have a blessing before the reading of the Torah. And you know that there's a blessing for everything, right? Amen.
Barku et Yahweh Hamivorach, Baruch Yahweh Hamivorach, Leolam Vahed, Baruch Yahweh Hamivorach, Leolam Vahed, Baruch Ata Yahweh, Eloheinu Melech Haulam, Asher Barchar Banu Meko Hahamim, Venatan Lanu et Torato, Baruch Ata Yahweh, Baruch Shemo no Tehen HaTorah. Amen. Everyone, bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed art you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed art you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. And please remain standing, if you can, for the reading of the Torah. If you'll turn in your scriptures to Devarim. Devarim, that's Deuteronomy. And let's turn to chapter 24. The whole portion actually starts in Deuteronomy 21.10, but we're going to read the last one-third of that. It goes through 25.19, so we're going to start 24.14. Deuteronomy 24, 14, and we'll read through the end of the Torah portion, which is 25, 19. Do not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy of your brothers or of your strangers who are in your land within your gates. Give him his, his wages on the same day and do not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and lifts up his being to it so that he does not cry out against you to Yahweh, and it shall be sin in you. Fathers are not to put to death, be put to death for their children, and children are not to be put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. Do not twist the right ruling of a stranger or the fatherless, nor take, garments, uh, take the garment of a widow. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim, and that Yahweh your Elohim ransomed you from there. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this word. When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheath in the field, do not go back to get it. Let it be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, so that Yahweh your Elohim might bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, do not examine the branch behind you. Let it be for the stranger, and for the fatherless, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean behind you. Let it be for the stranger, the fatherless, and for the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this word. Chapter 25. When there is a dispute between men, then they shall come unto judgment, and they shall be judged, and the righteous declared righteous, and the wrongdoer declared wrong. And it shall be, if the wrongdoer is to be struck, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and be struck in his presence with the number of blows according to his wrong. Forty strikes he gives him, but no more, lest he strike him with many more blows than these, and your brother be degraded before your eyes. Do not muzzle an ox while it is threshing. When brothers dwell together and one of them has died and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not become a stranger's outside. Her husband's brother does, not, does go into her and shall take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son, which she bears, does rise up for the same of his dead brother, so that his name is not blotted out of Israel. But if a man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up name 
to his brother in Israel, he does not agree to perform the duty of my husband's brother. The elders of his city shall cause him and shall call him and speak to him, and he shall stand and say, I have no desire to take her. Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders and remove his sandal from his foot and shall spit in his face and answer and say, Thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And in Israel his name shall be called the house of him who has his sandal removed. When men fight with one another and a man and his brother and his wife one of shall draw near to rescue her husband from the hand of one striking him, and she shall put out her hand and take hold of him by his genitals. Then you shall cut off her hand. Your eye does not pardon. You shall not, ha you shall not have in your bag different weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and right weight, perfect and right measure so that you, they prolong your days in the soil which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. For all who does these and all who do unrighteously are an abomination to Yahweh your Elohim. Remember what the Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Mitzrayim, how he met you on the way and attacked you, your back, all the feeble ones in your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear Elohim. Therefore, it shall be when Yahweh your Elohim has given you rest from your enemies all around and in the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you to possess as an inheritance that you blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. Do not forget. Amen. And then we have a blessing after the reading of the Torah. Baruch ata Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu Torah emet vayke Yeholam nata betocheinu Baruch ata Yahweh Baruch shemo notein ha Torah Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the Universe, who has given us the Torah of Truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. And you may be seated. From what we read there, let's turn back before we begin here. To, um, we're going to pray, but let's turn back to chapter 21 of Deuteronomy. And we'll begin at verse 10. So Deuteronomy 21.10. Before we begin, let's pray. Abba, Father, I thank you and praise you so much for your many blessings to your people. Yahweh, I would just pray right now that you would send your Ruach and just overflow each person here from the head to their toe with your Ruach. As David said when he was faced with his enemies, which we are every day faced with enemies, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. So, Father, for each one of us, I would pray an anointing on each one an overflowing of your Ruach, and come and teach us now with your Ruach. In Yeshua's name, amen. So, chapter 21 of Devarim, beginning at verse 10. And this is where we get the name of the Torah portion from. This is when you go out, this is where you get it from, which, which is ki titze. So when you go forth or when you go out, it says there in verse 10, to fight against your enemies. Now, when I, when I read that first part of that verse, you guys, what do you think of when you think of fighting against your enemies? Do you think of going out and battling with your sword today against flesh and blood? 
Is that what you guys think of, right? You got your sword in your hand and you're going out and you're cutting down the enemy, right? No? Okay. So what do you think of? What's that? I know you guys are all thinking the same thing. For me, it's going in my prayer closet and, and doing battle with principalities and powers of darkness that Amen. have their way with men. Okay. So that's one way to do it. Anyone else? Anybody brave in here? A brave warrior. Okay. So what David said is very true. That's what we do. We battle against these Hey, he said principalities. You know, that's an interesting word. Years ago, there was a guy I was listening to, he was talking about spiritual warfare, and he said principalities are nothing more than a, an evil entity called a prince over a palatee, which is a piece of land. So it's a prince over a palatee. And so if you drive into a certain area, sometimes you may even feel an oppression from demonic forces. And you can immediately begin to pray against them. And did you know that you have power to get rid of those demonic forces according to Scripture? Amen. But in Yeshua's name, it's not in your own flesh or your name, but it's in Yeshua's name. Hey, the power that created the universe, right? Right? Did you know that you have the power in you or available to you that created the universe? To me, that's an awesome thing. What do you guys think? I think it's awesome. Hmm. So when you go out to fight against your enemies here in Deuteronomy 21.10, that's where we get the name of the Torah portion, and it's Ki Tetse. And, you know, I looked up the root of this word, and it says to send or sent with commandment or to take out. So if you're sent with a commandment and then take out, what's that mean? Doesn't the Torah give us instructions on how to battle against the enemy, right? Okay? So... So you're sent with a commandment. You should, didn't Yeshua tell his Talmudim, his disciples, to go and go into different cities and cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, those four things he told them to do? So do, is that possible that we could have that power today to do that? If they did, we certainly have. We certainly have that power available to us. And you know a lot of what you may go through is you may pray against some demonic forces that are coming and Yahweh can deal with those for you as you cast them out. But a lot of what we go through is just waiting on Yahweh. And it seems like that's the hardest part. At least it is for me. Since I'm a firstborn and I'm gung-ho and I want to get it done now. Anybody a firstborn in here and want to just get it done right now? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's difficult sometimes to wait on Yahweh and his timing. But you know what? That helps us firstborns have patience and grow and stretches us. Oh, man. Hallelujah. So when I saw this definition, I, I looked up the word forth, by the way. When you go forth or when you go out. And it's the, it's the root word yatsah in Hebrew. It means to send with commandment or take out. But when I saw the, word, the phrase take out, I thought about taking out the enemy. Isn't that what a warrior does in battle? They take out the enemy. So how do you take out the enemy in a spiritual context today? How would you guys do that? Any I, thoughts about speaking how you do that? his word. Yes. It's speaking his word, and in, in everything that you do, put your hands to do. You, mm -hmm. That's a powerful weapon that mm -hmm. I love to use. I love to read my Bible out loud. I believe that that chases the enemy from my house. 
Okay. And then when I'm in a, a situation where I'm confronting the enemy, to bring scripture to mind and speak them out loud. Good. That's really good, Darren, because demons can't hear you think. They can only hear you speak. They can't read your mind. So we need to vocalize Yahweh's word, don't we? Amen. Anyone else, any thoughts about that? How do you do spiritual battle? How do you do spiritual warfare? Pray, okay? So we read the word, we speak it out loud, we pray, we pray out loud against the demonic forces, don't we? Okay? It says here, in the rest of this verse, verse 10, it says, And Yahweh your Elohim shall give them into your hand. They're already given into your hand, is what its scripture says. So are we supposed to be afraid of an enemy that Yahweh has already defeated and given into our hand? No. We don't have to be afraid of the enemy. Hallelujah. And you shall take them captive. Now, what do you think of when it says, and you shall take them captive, this enemy? Does a verse come to your mind about taking something captive? Every thought, Every thought captive. Okay, so take every thought captive. So how do you take a thought captive? Well, I recognize it, whether it's from Yahweh or the enemy, and then I rebuke that thought. I, okay. um, and I ask Yahweh to change my thinking. And, and it... It's a constant thing, minute by minute, hour by hour, throughout the day. That I, I, I got to recognize Yahweh in everything. Good. Anyone else? I think that the first thing before you can even take anything captive is that you have to realize that it's an enemy. Oh, yes. Very good. Because a lot of times, one of the things for me is that you know, our thoughts, if we're talking about our thoughts, they just kind of run like a river through our head, and we don't even notice them. Mm. And so you have to recognize that before you can grab it and do something with it. So I think that's the first step, and then you have to deal with that, with Scripture, with, mm -hmm. you know... Testing it, testing Good. those thoughts, Good. whether they're of Yah or whether they're of yourself or whether they're of the evil one. Good. Good. So you can have the flesh, and then you can have those evil cohorts that follow Hasatan, right? Amen. Pastor Rick. I believe that part of spiritual warfare is we need to confront, too. And that's part of this process of, of taking captive. We find... Um, we, even in Israel crossing over into the land, they had, they, Yahweh told them, I've given them into your hand, but there was still a need for them to confront and to, to take it themselves. And, and in, the, in, in Goliath, David and Goliath was the same thing, is that he, he confronted it and told him that I come to you, uh, not in my name, but in the name of Yahweh, the, the Almighty. And so when you look at this, you know, what does it mean to take our, our thoughts captive? It means to confront the, with the truth and to, to take our thoughts captive to the truth. In other words, don't allow the enemy to, to have any foothold. Paul, Paul talks about that too, about not letting the enemy have a foothold or hostile have a foothold in our lives. So we need to confront with the truth and stand on the truth and, and take those thoughts captive. Good. Good, very good. Anyone else? Any thoughts so far about spiritual battle that you're doing? Are all of you doing spiritual battle? Are all of you battling against the enemy? It's very important that you do. It protects you, protects your household, your family, and so on. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is where that phrase is about taking every thought 
taking captive every thought or bringing into captivity, if you will, every thought. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, let's see, let's begin in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds. You know, years ago, um, there was a spiritual leader that taught me about uh, one, one area, one fra- phase, if you will, about spiritual warfare. And he was saying that strongholds are built on little, imagine like, a, a, say, a checkerboard. And that checkerboard is on your soul, in your soul realm. Because if you're, if, you, if you're a believer, if you have recognized Messiah Yeshua as Yahweh, and you have fallen on your face in repentance, recognizing you have violated his Torah and cried out to him in repentance, then he is faithful and just to, to forgive you of your sins, and then he's going to come into your spirit to dwell with your spirit. So demons can't get into your spirit area, that spirit realm of you, right? Okay? But, they, but if they were there to begin with because of perhaps... Um, ancestral sins, or perhaps you allowed a, a door open through unrepentant sin, and they were able to, before you were a believer, they could have come into your spirit area of your of your being, but then they have to move out of there, and they could go into your soul area of your being, and so we do battle against them. We can, you can actually get rid of them from there. And then they're going to be out there, and they're going to want to oppress you. They're going to want to oppress you no matter what. They're going to keep on coming back over and over and over again. But aren't we to t- take joy in all trial that Yahweh puts us through? Because we know that that trial helps to build up our belief in him. And don't we want our belief to be built up so strong that it has the power of the Ruach that hovered over the waters at the beginning of creation and then spoke and everything was created? So it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. For weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but the mighty in Elohim for overcoming strongholds. Verse 5, overthrowing reasonings and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive or bringing into captivity every thought to make it obedient to Messiah. And it's like my sister here was saying, you have to recognize that possibly that thought that's coming in isn't just your thought, but it is actually coming from a wicked, evil entity called a demon. And we, need, we can take authority over those and cast them out in Yeshua's name. Taking captive every thought. So you're taking captive this enemy, and you're casting it out in the name of Yeshua. And then it says uh, to make it, to make it obedient to the Messiah. So you tell it to go where Yeshua tells it to go, and it has to. In Yeshua's name, it has to. And then verse 6 says, and being ready to punish all disobedience, this is our Messiah, when your obedience is complete. Does that sound like something perhaps at the end of days, perhaps? So what do you think when your obedience is complete could mean. Or I think in the King James it says, and fulfilled. You guys remember a verse that talks about fulfilled? Any thoughts? David. Well, as you were saying that, I was thinking of... uh when we stand before Yahweh, that we will look upon him and be as he is. And in my heart, I was thinking that that that's the completeness because why I'm here, I'm going to, I'm going to fail. The the best I can do is in him. And so we'll just continue on. But looking forward to that Mm -hmm. day that I look upon him and become as he is. Good. 
Good, very good. Someone else. Uh, when um, Yeshua was hanging on the cross, it is done. Good. Or um, I came to fulfill the law, not to get rid of it. Okay. So um, everything is in obedience to Amen. Yahweh. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn to that passage, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. These are, starts off in Matthew chapter 5 with what we all well know as the Beatitudes, right? You know there's the Beatitudes in the Torah too? It's in Deuteronomy. We'll get to that, but you have the Beatitudes here of the Blesseds. And we all want blessings, don't we? Everybody wants a blessing. We don't want to be cursed. But we can be cursed if we're not obeying Yahweh. And it doesn't have to be... Um, it's supposed to be something that drives us back to Yahweh, if you will. Because Yahweh is so long-suffering and merciful to his people that he wants to drive you back to him. And sometimes, perhaps, that is the only way that he can get our attention. Okay. So it says here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, this is where Yeshua is speaking. He says, Do not think I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to complete. Well, that last part, I did not come to destroy but to complete, that can be associated with the first part, I did not come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. But is it possible that it could also, that last part, I did not come to destroy, but to complete. I did not come to destroy you, but to complete you. Okay, because the Torah is already completed in Messiah Yeshua. Now, if you look up the word complete or fulfill there, I think it says in the King James, it talks about in definition meaning to fully preach or to confirm something, which, he's, which Yeshua is doing by quoting from the Torah, which he voiced into men's hearts, and they wrote it down. So all of the Torah from, from Genesis through Revelation is given by Yahweh and, and is his instructions. Do not, so do not think I came to destroy or do away with or violate the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. So if he did not come to violate or, or destroy the Torah or the prophets or you, he came to complete you or, if you will, if you go back into the Hebrew, it's the word malo, which has to do with restoring you, restoring you back to Messiah Yeshua, the living Torah, so that you can be, if you will, his ambassadors or his priests before him to the nations. Okay, so not all of us are going to go out and travel all around the whole world and proclaim Yeshua to the nations, but you can do it right where you're at. Can't you? Amen. So don't let an opportunity pass you by if that ruach, that small voice in your head says, say something to someone about me. Ask them about me. Have you ever had that happen to you? Yeah, we all have, haven't we? And let's not ever ignore it. Let's not be embarrassed about Yahweh. Okay, isn't that what it really comes down to? Maybe perhaps that you're embarrassed about speaking to a stranger about Yahweh. And I've told you about the many incidences with my little son, we'd get on an elevator and he'd look right up at a stranger and he'd say, do you know Yahweh? So if, if he can do that, you can do it too. Oh, man. Any thoughts so far? 
As you said that, uh, being embarrassed, I was reminded of what the scripture says about it. When we acknowledge Yahweh before men, that he will acknowledge us before the Father. Amen. In the same aspect, if we disown him before men, that he would disown us before the Father. And that, that's terrifying to me because he's, he's my, my greatest love. And to be ashamed of his truth, is I've, that's when I've completely failed. And to have that courageous spirit that wants to share that love, it's, it's so fulfilling. And it, I believe the evil one is attached to that to, to make us feel shame or uh, fear or w one of those things that would keep us from fulfilling the Great Commission, going into all the world. So you, you may get little lies whispered to you, David, but you have overcome those. That's overcoming the wicked one and his deceitful lies that they whisper into your ear. Go ahead, Peter. When he said that about being courageous, um, I was thinking that fit really well in Philippians 1.6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Yeshua Mashiach. So, I mean, where confidence or our courage comes in him and his power, like he is the master potter, like he knows what he's doing. He made the universe. He can make us into Amen. a wonderful, glorious being. So, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Anyone else? Any thoughts come to your mind of Yahweh's Ruach speaking to you? Don't let the, the wicked one whisper thoughts of, of, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't say that. What will they think of you? It doesn't matter what they think of you. You know, Yahweh is strong. Amen. Several ones have um, said the word obedience in different ways. And I just think that, and even that which you read in Second Corinthians there, the very next word talked about that obedience. And I just continue to marvel that obedience begets obedience. Once we begin that down that path where we actually are hearing his ancient voice, that there's particular things that he looks for in his people, we just started keeping the Sabbath. I mean, that was what Father spoke to our heart through circumstances. And as soon as we started doing that, all of a sudden, you know, the still small voice was talking to us about this and that. Or we'd see things in the scripture that we'd never seen before. And we'd say, hey, we should do that, shouldn't we? Yeah, let's do that, you know. And it, it just kept getting one after another, after another, after another. And we never did anything. Uh, I mean, we're just asking him, right? You know, show us. Sure, we're praying. Show us where we're failing you. Show us, show us where we should change. But it just, I, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time describing it. It just sort of came to us out of the blue. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. that, wasn't that wasn't very patient. Well, I've been like that for 30 years, you know? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, we're just, we want to change. And we're seeing things that we've never seen before. I think it all comes back to obedience. It begets more obedience, and that's what right. he's looking for. And, but when we miss the mark, we have an advocate before the Father through Mashiach. Amen. Hallelujah. Good. Anyone else? Hmm. You know, when we, what Raylan was saying is, is very important because that worked for me, too. I, I would take one thing that Yahweh would give me that was an obedience of Torah that I never was doing before, and I'd start doing that. But you know, I didn't get anything else from him until I started doing that one thing, and then he would reveal something else, and then I would do that. But if, you don't, if you're not obedient to him, he's not going to reveal things to you. So that's another really cool thing, a really positive thing that we can look forward to, saying, oh, give me more, Yahweh. Well, you get, you get more when you're obedient to him. Hallelujah. Sometimes I like to play the advocate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, and, uh, you know, the opposite advocate. And it's kind of like, okay, so... If he's talking to us, 
and we're disobedient, why would he give us more? For what reason? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's like uh, talking to a wall, you know, throwing right. pearls before swine. Why would he give us that? Mm -hmm. So unless he, you know, mm -hmm. he's pretty smart. <laughs> mm -hmm. He knows that, um, he, he knows our hearts and he knows that we want something if we're gonna truly obey him. Just like we see our children doing, mm -hmm. you know, we know them. We watch their behavior, we see their heart, and, you know, we instruct according to that. So, um, we don't see very much as children, but as parents, we do see a lot of how our children behave, and we give them as they can handle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and especially through their obedience, you know. Otherwise, right. it's like talking to a brick wall to our children, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. That's very good. I like examples because they bring the point home. It's like if a father or mother says, son or daughter, take out the garbage, and the daughter or son says, no, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> that doesn't go over real well, does it? <laughs> well, we're talking about fulfill, and, uh, which is obedience. But... Even our understanding comes with walking it out. Fulfill, when I think of fulfill, in it's walking it out. Mm -hmm. um, I quit eating pork and shellfish before I even believed that Yahweh wanted me to. And I really didn't, but I knew he would honor it anyway. Mm -hmm. I still thought it was all right, but I quit. And I thought, well, you know, these people believe that. I'm going to quit. He's going to honor it. I did, fully didn't. Once I did then, he gave me more and more understanding of that. The same with the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to believe that it's a commandment of Yahweh to, that Saturday's, you know, the Sabbath, and that's the one you should keep. Mm -hmm. But I knew that when I did that, that he would honor it anyway, even if it wasn't his commandment. Then I got the understanding later mm -hmm. by doing it. It's just, it's like having kids. Um, it teaches you so much about Yahweh. People that don't have kids, they're, they're lacking certain understanding about Yahweh that you just can't get till you do that and have them. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, Dad, how, why do I have to do that? Have you ever heard that before? Or, Mom, why do I have to do that? Well, because I said so. Or perhaps you went into some more explanation like he always does with us, doesn't he, Pastor Rick? Could it be, uh, there's some like languages that I, that, um, that I like to go to, some ways that, that Scripture describes things. And could it be that, that as it says in, 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 like in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, that he's al already given us this stuff, but he, and he says so, he says, you have been given everything required for life and godliness. But I can't possess it until I begin to live that life of godliness. If I keep choosing a life of ungodliness, then I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to receive instead of what he gave me already. Okay. It's the same thing as a, as a bank account. You know, you could, you could leave your kid a million dollars in a bank account with stipulations. And if, if the kid doesn't live up to those stipulations, He'll never be able to draw a dollar out, but he still has a million dollars. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's still available if he meets the stipulations. All right. Good. Good. Someone else. Okay. Well, you know how the name of the Torah portion is supposed to, and it, it always does if you look close enough, the meaning of the, tor the Torah portion will relate to the whole thing. So the name of our Torah portion is Ki Tetze, and it has to do with sending forth, going forth, sent with a commandment, or to take out, take out the enemy. So when we read that last part, if you turn back to our Torah portion, if you're still in Matthew. So we read from 2414. In 2414, 
of Deuteronomy, Debarim says, do not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy of your brothers or of your strangers who are in the land within your gates. Okay, so if the name of the Torah portion is sent with a command and take out the enemy, so that's what you're to do here. The first thing that it says is do not oppress a hired servant. So if you're keeping Yahweh's command about loving your neighbor as yourself, that summed up, you know, with love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, which is straight out of the Torah, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it's not a new command in the, in the, the New Testament, but it's a restored one, if you will. It's one that Yahweh wants to restore back, just like he wants to restore all of his commands back to us. So in verse 14 of Devarim here of chapter 24, it says, Do not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy. Now, in order to have a servant, what do you have to have in order to have a servant? What is, who does the servant serve? A master, right? So you have to have a master. Okay? So in oppressing a hired servant, what, would, what realm would the master here that's oppressing a hired servant, what realm would he be falling into? A spiritual realm. You have spirit, two spiritual realms, right? Light and dark, right? Okay, so what realm is this guy falling into? Darkness, right? He's going to fall into... If he's oppressing, who's his master? Is it Yahweh? No, it's not Yahweh. It's going to be his Hasatan as his master. Did you know that, that you cannot eat at the table of Yahweh and demons at the same time? You can try, but you're not going to be able to do it. Hmm. What's that really mean? Eating at the table of Yahweh or eating at the table of demons, with demons. When you sit down and eat with somebody, when we, do, when we have Oneg back there and we sit down and eat with each other and, and we, we come into agreement, if you will, we're agreeing with each other, we sit down and eat, we, we um, take in sustenance together and, and we, hopefully we talk about Yahweh and his ways. Not about worldly things, but we talk about Yahweh and his ways. What, what is Yahweh doing in your life? Do you want to share that with your brother and sister? Or, or do, you know, do you not want your brother or sister to know about that, perhaps? Now, you don't have to go into all kinds of details. But you can share something and ask him to pray for you. Or share some praise that Yahweh has... Um, because you're praising Yahweh because of what something that Yahweh has done for you. That helps to build up your brother. When, when, when you share something or give a testimony, like David has given me testimonies about when Yahweh tells him to talk to somebody, and he does, and they turn and accept Yahweh as their personal Savior. You know, awesome. Doesn't that help build up each, each other when we do that? We build each other up in Messiah, right? And do you know that you can't do that sitting at home by yourself? You ha you're supposed to have a community that you do things with, right? So we're supposed to have this community where we come and we build each other up on Shabbat. And we, we love on each other. I love each one of you guys. I'm getting to know you. Some I know more than others. But you know what? I love all of you guys. Hallelujah. So here in verse 14 of Deuteronomy 24, it talks about not oppressing. There is a demon of oppression. There's, there's oppressing demons, if you will. From, that means from the outside oppressing you. They're not possessing you. That would be in your spirit. And they're not inhabiting you, they don't live in, they're not living in your soul, but they're oppressing you from outside. 
okay? And so we can come against them in the name of Yeshua, and they have to flee. As long as, through repentance, there's nothing that they have as a foothold to grab onto and say, no, I don't have to leave. So you can cast them out that way. It says, then in verse 15, give him his wages on the same day, and do not let the sun go down on it. For he is poor and lifts up his being to it, so that he does not cry out against you to Yahweh, and it shall be sin in you. Verse 16, fathers are not put to death for their children, and children are not put to death for their fathers. Each one dies for his own sin. So everyone's responsible for their own um, race, if you will. We're running a race, as Shaul said, right? We're running a race, if you will, that, and some would say, oh, well, so what, what are you saying, Steve? Does that mean you have, your, your salvation is tied up with works? Well, yeah, it is tied up with works. Because Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my Torah. David told us that earlier. If you love me, keep my commandments. The commandments don't save you. They're a result of your salvation in Messiah Yeshua, are they not? Go, go ahead, Pastor Rick. Right up my alley, okay? <laughs> because the truth is, is that he, all he says that those that don't love me and don't keep my commands cannot receive the one I'm sending. They don't, right. they don't know him. They, they won't see him, they don't know him, and they can't receive. And so basically, you know, we still enter in through the blood, but basically our life the power to live the life is disconnected as if we're not living, if we're not loving him by following commands. Good, good. Someone else? Dale. Well, the idea of love is, the, I, this idea of love is not about feeling warm and fuzzy. It's not an emotional attachment, but is a love of action. We prove our love. We prove our affection for the Heavenly Father by what we do but not by how we feel. And I think sometimes we need to focus on the idea that we need to be active individuals in promoting the Heavenly Father to be that light on the hill. Mm -hmm. We can't sit uh, complacent in our seats and say, I love you, Heavenly Father, and we do nothing. Mm -hmm. For it says in James, I will prove my faith by my works. And it's by the faith, the trust of works, that we prove our affection for the Heavenly Father. You know what we used to call that years ago? We should call that lighting a fire under somebody. That's what Yahweh wants to do. He wants to light his ruach of fire underneath you. Did you know that the ruach of Yahweh is likened to the sheen? In the, and it's at these, it looks kind of like this. It's three points. And it's, it's this fire of Yahweh. It looks kind of like flames. But it's also teeth. It can be likened, the sheen of Yahweh can be, in, in the Hebrew letters, can be likened to teeth. And when you think of teeth... At least I, I think of a lion, lion's teeth. Well, Yeshua is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Savior, the Messiah of the whole world. The first verse I learned when I was a little boy was John 3.16. For Yahweh so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In me, in Messiah Yeshua, this is what he's saying. So he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he, he will go before you as that lion and destroy the enemy before you. The power that is available to us in our Messiah is awesome. And all we have to do is take hold of it. How do you take hold of it? crying out to Yahweh from perhaps you can't, you can't even form words and then the Ruach steps in and gives, you, gives that to the Father for you. It says in verse 18 here of Deuteronomy 24, it says, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim. And that Yahweh your Elohim ransomed you from there. Therefore, I'm commanding you to do this word. So he's commanding you to do right rulings. 
don't twist things. Doesn't Scripture say someplace about that they twist Scripture for their own destruction? Remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim. That means, in a spiritual context, you were dead once, and, and in the land of captivity, the land of Hasatan's captivity, if you will, jumping outside the plain and simple meaning of the passage to a spiritual connection, that Yahweh your Elohim ransomed you from there. In other words, he reached out with his right arm, his mighty right arm, and he ransomed you or, he, or he, he redeemed you from there. What's he redeeming you from? Death to life, right? There's two realms. There's the realm of death. There's the realm of life. We want to enter into the realm of life. So in this realm of life that we have, we don't have to have a burden upon us that the definition of oppress would be a burden upon you that overloads you and weighs you down. This yoke that's on you that is talked about in Acts 15 when they, when they came together and talked about the issue that was at hand because some taught ones of, or some, those that were believing in Messiah Yeshua that were of the circumcision, or in other words, Jews, they were coming and saying, tell your, ta your new taught ones or your new converts that they got to keep the Torah of Moshe in order to be saved. Well, what's wrong with the Torah of Moshe? It's wonderful, right? It's life. But, you, but in Messiah Yeshua, if you will, who is the living Torah... When you come into him, then you're going to want to keep those things. So many times I've talked to unbelievers, and they don't want to do this because, oh, then i got to follow all those rules. And I don't want to do that. I want to do my own thing. They just don't get it. The fact that if they do come in, then they'll want to keep his ways. They'll be overflowing with his ruach to where they just want to bubble over and tell everybody about him. Don't lose that. Let Yahweh, ask Yahweh to um, give you that excitement to light that fire under you for Yahweh and his ways. What do you guys think? Do you guys want that? Do you want that excitement that he can only give you? There's no, no, no brother is going to give it to you. No sister is going to give it to you. It's going to be from Yahweh. But we can build each other up. Hallelujah. We're so out of time. Is there anything anybody wants to say before we close? Any thoughts so far? You're praising Yahweh, right? You're praising him for everything that he's given you, even the things that don't seem so nice, right? We praise him anyway. And when we praise him, it releases amazing power of the Ruach of Yahweh in your life. Abba Father, I thank you and praise you. Once again, I thank you and praise you for your great name. We want to lift up your name, the name of Yahweh. We want to lift him up high. We want to lift your name up amongst our brethren. We want to lift your name up among the nations because there's power in your name. Just in, in all of your Hebrew letters, Yahweh, there's power. There's amazing power. Just in the Aleph itself, there's a whole plan of salvation in the Aleph itself, the first letter. And so, Yahweh, we may not know Hebrew. We don't need necessarily to know Hebrew. We just, need, we just want to praise you. We want to praise you and lift you up in our own way. And then that you will build us up. You will strengthen us. You will give us encouragement. I'm thinking of Joshua. And in Joshua 1, it says over and over and over again to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Joshua needed that. We all need that. And so I say to you, be strong and courageous in Messiah Yeshua. He is your deliverer. He is your strength. doesn't matter what you're going through. Yahweh is our strength and our deliverer. 
the enemy is defeated already before us. David knew that when he came against Goliath, didn't he? He knew that the, that giant was defeated. Thank you and praise you, Yahweh, for each heart here. And I pray a special blessing on each one. I thank you and praise you, Yahweh, for this day where we can come and worship before you to lift up praises to you. That's all we want to do is just praise you, Yahweh, and lift you up. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. In Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, it says, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and his son, saying, This is how you bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Thus they shall put Yahweh's name on the children of Israel, and Yahweh himself shall bless you. Yahweh Panavelecha Vikunecha Yasa Yahweh Panavelecha Behasem Lecha Lecha Shalom. Bring us back to you, Yahweh, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. Amen. And you are dismissed.